Paul said in Philippians 1, he said, being confident of this very thing, he said, I know God which has begun good work in you is able to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I'm thankful that I know that I can do all things tonight through Christ which strengtheneth me. Let's give God some glory here tonight. Praise His worthy name. All right, we'll be in Acts chapter number 8. If you brought your Bible here tonight, Acts chapter number 8. And while you're turning there, I want to update the church on uh, something that happened today. Uh, we had come over here and was working downstairs because we had the basement flooded and I needed to try to get that in order for tonight because I knew the kids were going to make use of that. So we come over here and spent a while sucking up all the water and I set my fans up. Uh, to try to get it to dry out. And while I was waiting on that, we went down here to the corner to hand out some more Bibles. And a lady came by. We gave away two more Bibles today. A lady came by and took a Bible and was very kind, very happy to receive the Bible, said thank you, and then left. And evidently she just drove around the block and come back. And when she came back, she parked her car and got out of the car and came walking over to me. And she introduced herself and told me a little bit about her background and her situation. She said her name was Tina. She was down here from Detroit, Michigan. They'd come down here and evidently they're living here now and they were looking for a church. And uh, she said she had six kids. Uh, so uh, you pray for this family. She told me she had a lot of questions. She asked about the church. And I did my best to answer the questions, and evidently she was satisfied with that because she told me she was going to come Sunday morning. Now, pray that she will. A lot of people tell me they're going to come, and then they never make it. But pray that uh, she'll be different, that she'll come on and bring her family, and, and God will bless them richly, give them what they need. She told me that she had uh, attended at some other church in the area, and uh, she had some uh, issues there with... Uh, folks gossiping and uh, I told her I said well listen we're all fallen creatures of God we all fall short of the glory of God I said if you come to our church what you'll see is a church that's not perfect I said but however if you were to come to our church and experience something like that although we're not perfect I said I will try to address it you know a lot of folks will just try to sweep issues under the rug and act like they didn't happen and, right. and just let them fester. And we certainly uh, haven't done church discipline perfect here. And I don't think anybody, I don't think anybody has, you know, uh, completely perfect. But we have to try to address situations. And I told her, I said, our church, we're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but we try. We're out here trying to spread the gospel. So you come on out and be with us, and we'd love to see you. And she told me she'd be here. So we're mentioning that to you tonight. So help us pray between now and Sunday, because we'd like to get that family in and get them in under the gospel. Amen? All right. God bless you. We love you for being here. Acts chapter 8 in the Word of God. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 1 tonight. The Bible says, And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word of God. I want you to note that. Verse 5, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Hallelujah. See what happens when persecution comes along? And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many, that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. In verse 8, I like verse 8, it says, and there was great joy in that city. Amen. 
Father in heaven, we come humbly before you once again. And we ask, dear God, your blessings upon this time together here tonight. Lord, I pray, God, that you'll speak to our hearts. Those who have come out tonight faithful and desirous to hear a word from the Lord. Lord, don't send them away empty. May the sheep be fed here in this place tonight. And we'll glorify you for all that you do. In Christ's name, amen and amen. God bless you for standing. You may be seated in the presence of God. All right, so here's where we are. We left off last Wednesday night having just discussed how the, these early Christians were being persecuted so intensely after the death of Stephen, that great man of God, that deacon of the church. They drug him out of the city for preaching the Word of God, stoned him to death. And as we told you there last Wednesday night, there were a lot of people at that time who wanted to persecute Christians, but they held back. Until the day came when they saw this great open public persecution of Stephen, and then they just released all the persecution that they wanted to do. Uh, so the Bible tells us how that these Christians were being persecuted so intensely after Stephen's death that they fled from Jerusalem and they scattered into other nations of the world. And wherever they traveled, thank God, they took the gospel with them. They didn't go empty-handed. They took the gospel with them. Whoever they encountered, they shared the gospel. Wherever they went, they shared the gospel. Everyone they came into contact with, they preached the gospel and shared with them the good news of Jesus Christ risen and coming again. This gospel message was spreading like wildfire. And the harder, here's the thing about the gospel, the harder the persecution that came against them, the more the gospel spread. The more they persecuted the church, the more they preached. It was spreading all over the place. Satan had tried to destroy the young church and to defeat them, but the harder he tried, the more they shared the word. Amen? Satan's best efforts to destroy and to tear down only encouraged them to keep right on preaching the word of God. That's the way it still is today. You can't stop the gospel. Amen? It is the power. Come on, somebody. It's the power of God unto salvation. You can't stop it. The devil can't stop it. No man can stop it. The harder you try to stop it and the more you fight against it, the more the gospel spreads and the stronger it goes forth. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And when preachers can understand that it's the gospel that's the power of God unto salvation and not them, I'll tell you what, that takes the pressure off a man right there. Yep. When you begin to understand that, I thank God for the day that I began to understand this great reality. As long as we preach the gospel, listen, as long as a preacher or a man of God preaches the gospel, it's up to God to give the increase. As long as he's preaching the true word of God, he's preaching the true gospel, it's God's. God can do with it whatever he wants to do at that point. Amen. It's, it's all based on the Lord and God given the increase and not on man's ability. So in spite of this great persecution, these believers, they weren't off in hiding. They weren't hunkered down in the corner somewhere. They weren't cowering down in fear. No, they were preaching the gospel. They had been preaching the gospel before this great outbreak of persecution. And then after Stephen was martyred and the persecution really became turned on, what did they do? They just kept right on preaching the gospel. Even after being scattered, they kept right on preaching the gospel. It says they went, and I love this. I love this. It says they went everywhere preaching the gospel. That re refers to proclaiming the gospel. These scattered believers were involved in evangelism. Now, you know, even though the Bible does speak specifically of people who have been especially gifted to be evangelists, all Christians are called to spread the word. Amen? All Christians are called to be lights and witnesses and to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Every one of us to a lost world. And the devil has no power to stop it. When Satan tried to persecute God's people, all that did was promote the very thing that he was trying to tear down. That's all it did. And here in the book of Acts, it lit a fire under these believers who went about into new areas with a new zeal to proclaim the Word of God. 
The Bible says here in verse number 5, it says, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. So what happens here is the Holy Ghost of God turns our attention to this man by the name of Philip. And I believe the reason for this if you're with me, say a good amen tonight. Amen. I believe the reason for this is because this man Philip was such a faithful example of evangelism. I believe it was because this man Philip was such a faithful example of service to God. Philip is the first missionary that's mentioned in the Bible. And that fact is going to be key when we look at the rest of the chapter 8 in the, the book of Acts. Now this was not Philip the Apostle who would have stayed back at Jerusalem, but this is Philip who was one of the seven who was chosen to serve the widows back in Acts chapter 6. He was in the same group of seven that Stephen was in. And he also had something else in common with Stephen, that great man of God. And that was the fact that both Philip and Stephen were faithful to the task that God gave them back in Acts chapter 6 to take care of those widows and to take care of the business and the affairs of the church. They were faithful to do this task and because they were faithful over this one thing, both of them had greater opportunities come out of that. Their horizons were broadened, their ministries were broadened, and they had more doors of opportunity to go out and to minister and to go out and to serve and to be a light because they were faithful over this other thing that God gave them to do. And it's still the same way today. If you will be faithful over that small thing that God gave you to do, He's able to open more doors unto you. But if you're not faithful over that one thing that God gave you to do, we'll have no right to expect God to broaden our horizons. Now the unique thing about this is that although the Bible talks about evangelists and Paul instructs Timothy to do the work of the evangelist, Philip is the only man in the Word of God that is given the specific title of evangelist. Nobody but Philip. And we see that in Acts chapter 21 and verse number 8 where the Bible says we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist which was one of the seven. What a great honor. What a great honor that was for Philip. Amen. And it's certainly fitting considering how groundbreaking his work was in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, just to give you a little background here, Israel had three main regions. There was Galilee in the north, there was Samaria in the middle, and there was Judea in the south. The city of Samaria, which was also in a region called Samaria, had been the capital of the northern kingdom back in the days of the divided kingdoms. But in B.C. 722, what happened was there was a great war that took place. This is 700 years before Christ. A great war took place, and many people from that area were taken captive. And all that was left in the land after this war was just the poorest of people that they had. And then what happened was those people who were left there who were so poor, they had to resettle the land with the foreigners that came in. So over time, the foreigners that came in, they intermingled and intermarried with the Jews that were left there, and there was a mixed race that came out of that, and that mixed race is what we refer to in the Bible as the Samaritans. It was the Samaritans who were called, and some of you who have been in church for a long time, you've heard preachers preach about this. This is true Bible history. It was the Samaritans that the pure Jews referred to as half-breeds. It was the Samaritans that the Jews referred to as apostates. And these two groups hated each other. They could not stand each other. It was these two groups who despised each other. But Jesus comes along and shows up on the scene. And in John chapter 4, Jesus, the Bible said he must needs go through Samaria. And the Lord commanded his disciples to go and preach the gospel in Samaria. Philip went directly to the city of Samaria and preached the gospel to them. Thank God. Samaria was located about 40 miles north of Jerusalem. 
It had been a place that had housed a lot of idolatry. It was a place that housed a lot of rebellion against God for like 150 years before it finally fell to the Assyrians in 722 B.C. <coughs> now a lot more could be said about that. But I'm going to try to condense it for you. That hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans and just let you know that in that 400 year, how many of you ever heard that that 400 year span between Malachi and Matthew is called the intertestamental period? There was a lot going on to, in that time frame. Amen. I've heard preachers say, well, God didn't speak. God might not have given any inspired scripture in that 400 years, but it was not a dead time at all. It was not a boring time whatsoever. You see, the, the believers, the Jews who were looking for the Messiah, their desire was just boiling over at this point, awaiting the coming of the Messiah. And during that 400 year span between Malachi and Matthew, that hostility that I told you about between the Jews and the Samaritans just kept right on growing. Then Jesus shows up. And how many is glad Jesus shows up? I'm glad He showed up in my life. Let me tell you, when Jesus showed up on the scene here in the Word of God, by the time we get to John chapter 4, He defies everything that they were accustomed to. What did He do? He comes along and in John chapter 4, He announces His Messiahship to who? A Samaritan woman. Go with me to John chapter 4. I want to read this to you. John chapter 4. And I'm going to begin reading in verse number 1 and bear with me because this is going to be a little extensive but it's very important and it's very pertinent to what we're talking about here tonight. John chapter 4 verse 1. The Bible says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou then greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, in that saidest thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto Him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. 
when he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Verse 30 says, Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Now this scene here in the word of God with the Samaritan woman set the example to show this world that our Lord and dear precious Savior, Jesus Christ, came into this world and he is committed to save all types of people. It's not just one group. It's not just two groups. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to call sinners to himself. He came to save all types of people. Now isn't it wonderful to know that though others might forsake you, others might hate you, others might look down upon you, others might consider you unworthy of love, others might consider you unworthy of respect, that even through all of that, Jesus came to give His life for us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Amen. We still have Jesus who loved us while we were yet sinners. He went to that cross and died for us no matter how bad we were. No matter how bad we've been. He loves us that much. Thank God. He gave this command in Acts chapter 1 in verse number 8. And we spent a lot of time talking about it when we covered that chapter. He told them to be witnesses at Jerusalem first and then in Judea and then Samaria and then under the uttermost parts of the earth. Now Philip was the one who intentionally began preaching the gospel in Samaria first. He went there to proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ to them. He heralded the message publicly. That's what we need to do today. Herald the message publicly. It doesn't need to be contained inside the four walls of the church. We need to herald the message publicly. That's what the early church did. Those who were closest to the Lord, that's what they did. But by the time we get to this New Testament time period here, the Samaritans had broken free from a lot of that idolatry that I told you about earlier. And they were worshiping the true and the living God. Now they might not have been perfect in the way they went about it, they might not have been completely consistent in the way that they went about that. They might have been a little confused in the way that they worshipped. That's what Jesus was talking about when He told the Samaritan woman, "Ye worship, ye know not what. That's what He was talking about. So given this foundation of belief, when Stephen showed up and he began to preach Jesus Christ as the Messiah that everybody had been looking for, they would have been ready to receive that. Do you know that there are some people that you're going to have to spend a little bit more time with? There are some people that you're going to have to spend a little bit more time tearing down that false belief system and filling them with the Word of God and filling them with the truth of Christianity. Amen. Then they'll be able to understand the gospel message because the Spirit of God has begun to work a work in their heart and through that Word that's been shared with them and preached to them, they could come to understand the gospel message. Then there are others, such as these Samaritans, who's, who they're already going to have some background, and they'll be ready to hear the gospel. But it all takes the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit had prepared the hearts of these Samaritans by this time to receive the gospel message. So when Philip came preaching, they were ready. There was a great spiritual awakening that took place. That's why Acts chapter 8 and verse number 6 says, And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. This is multitudes of people with one accord. They gave attention to what was said by Philip and the miracles that he performed. All they did was serve to authenticate that Philip was a great man of God. Verse number 7 tells us some of the miracles that took place. Look at it. It says, For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed. 
Those who were possessed by unclean spirits were freed from their bondage. The devil rallied all of his forces to oppose Jesus Christ when he walked on this earth. That's why Jesus Christ so frequently had to heal people who were demon possessed. And by the time we get to Acts chapter 8, he's still, the devil's still fighting the gospel this way. And Jesus is still healing demon possessed people through his apostles. I want you to know, listen to me. I want you to know. I'm going to wait till I've got everybody's attention. I want you to know that there are still demon-possessed people in this world today. There are still demon-possessed people in this world today. I'm going to say it again. C.S. Lewis talked about it in the screw tape letters where he explained to us that the devil and his demons will adapt themselves to whatever worldview is prevalent in any given location. They can be just as at home right here in America in this westernized, materialized worldview system as they are over in the third world countries where those magicians are working today. And then you have people who are demon possessed, but they don't show any signs of it. But it's still very real. Amen. And a lot of times, listen to me, a lot of times, they'll be the ones who are out there preaching a false gospel. There are people today, and I want to say this, and we covered this a little bit back in 2014 when we taught on the Trinity for so many weeks, how that there are some people who are caught in religious groups and cults who might truly be saved by the grace of God and they're just worshiping the Lord with all the light that they have and we need to pray for them that they'll be able to come out of that. But then there are some who are belligerent in their error. There are some who are bold in their error. There are some who are bold and belligerent about teaching and preaching false doctrine and a false gospel even in the face of sound refutation of that, they keep right on teaching and preaching a false gospel. Why, oh why, do they do that? Well, it could be they're demon possessed. That's right. Hey, it's real. It's very real. And when we encounter people like this, we need to remember. We don't have the power in and of ourselves to go to casting out demons. That's going to take the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I know that there are some people who will hear that and they will frown upon that idea, but it's the same concept when it comes to physical healing. When someone comes in this church and they need a physical healing and they come forward for prayer, the main thing that we are to do is to pray that God intercedes for them. Amen? And we're all going to agree to this. If anybody in this church ever gets a healing, it won't be because we had any special power. It'll be because God interceded in that situation. And we understand that it takes His power to see somebody healed and not our power. Yes. Now I know we live in a world today where it's very popular in a lot of religious circles for religious figures to go about hollering that they're going to bind the devil. But I'm going to tell this tonight. I'm going to be very bold in what I'm about to say. And I'm going to stand firm on it. Listen to me. The devil will not be bound unless it's the power of the Lord that binds him. That's, right. That's the only way that Satan will be bound. If you run headlong into a situation where you try to exercise your own authority over the devil and his demons, you might wind up like the sons of Sceva in Acts chapter 19 where they rushed headlong, and you can read about it, into a situation where they came upon a man who was demon-possessed, and they took it upon themselves to try to cast that demon out of the individual. And the Bible says that man overcame them, and they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Yeah. <laughs> <That's not funny. laughs> Never try to claim power for yourself that God didn't grant. Amen. We're in a spiritual warfare, but our instruction for this warfare is laid out in Ephesians chapter 6. Grab you a Bible and turn to Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10. Here the Word of God says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. 
For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. But it was God given power from feeling that these unclean spirits were unable to resist. And they were coming out of their victims. In addition to this, the Bible says that Philip also healed many who had been lame and paralyzed. So the power of God was evident in it. So the people paid close attention to it. Look at verse number 8. It says there was great joy in that city. So after all, all of this preaching and miracle working and healing, it resulted in the salvation of many of these Samaritans in the ministry of Philip. But as all true gospel preaching does, listen to me, it resulted in some who truly believed they were the wheat. And then it resulted in some who were false believers and they were the tares. Just like a man named Simon that we're going to talk about next time. But I want to bring this to a close tonight by reminding all of us that the devil and his demons are doomed adversaries. The devil is a defeated foe tonight. They will not have the ultimate victory. The devil will not have the ultimate victory. Amen. We have the victory as God's people. And we need to live our lives in such a fashion that it reflects this truth. I heard a story about a man, and I'm going to close with this. And it's very fitting since today is known as Valentine's Day and I didn't plan it like this. But I want to share this with you. A man was writing a letter to the love of his life and his, her name was Betty. And he wrote, My dearest Betty, I love you beyond words. Webster does not have in his dictionary the necessary vocabulary to explain the depth of my love for you. Thoughts of you dance across the portals of my mind. You are my all-consuming passion. So enraptured am I regarding my love for you that the Pacific Ocean would seem like a small pond if I had to swim. And I could, as long as I knew you were waiting for me on the other shore. The heat of the Sahara Desert would never impede my progress to you, knowing that you would be the oasis that would refresh me when I arrived. There would be no inconvenience that I wouldn't endure for you. Climbing Mount Everest would only seem like getting over an anthill if I knew you were waiting at the precipice. All I'm simply saying, my darling, is that my love for you transcends time and space. P.S. I'll see you Saturday night if it doesn't rain. <laughs> now listen, I'm sure that you all would agree with me that that man right there was full of hot air. Full of hot air. He could talk a good game. He could talk a good talk. But he didn't go very deep, did he? While he could verbalize the elements of his overcoming, in reality, it didn't take very much at all to keep him away. Listen, I want to tell you tonight, it's easy for you to talk about being an overcomer. It's easy for you to talk about having the victory. It's easy to talk about living this way, but it's something else entirely different not to let the rain slow you down. 
So let's not let the rain slow us down tonight. Amen? Don't let the rain slow you down. Listen. Folks, look up here. Don't worry about them kids. He's God. Don't let the rain slow you down. Amen? We need to go on and live the life of overcomers. We're not going to be defeated. Jesus Christ has got the victory. This is the victory, the Bible said, that overcometh the world. Even our faith. Keep looking to Him. If you're here tonight and you're suffering some, from some kind of persecution, praise God for that. Amen. The Bible said, Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you're not, we need to check out. We need to make sure we're where we need to be with the Lord. Because these are crucial times that we're living in right now. God has sent a message tonight to remind us we are in a battle. We are in a warfare. It's very real. And we've got a whole armor of God that we can put on. And this world and the devil are not going to be able to defeat the church, Jesus Christ, and the gospel. It's not going to happen. All you have to do, if you don't believe me, is flip to Revelation and read chapter 20. They're going to the lake of fire. We're going to a better land. I rejoice in that tonight. Let's give God some praise. Amen. All right. Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you tonight for this time together. Lord, in Jesus' name, I pray, God, that your will be done in this service. I pray, God, that many would come and lay their burdens down, be strengthened. Lord, receive an increase in their faith, just whatever's needed here in this place tonight. Thy will be done, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you for all that you do. Save that one which may be lost. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. Would you stand with us tonight? You need to come. Let's all remember.